Well, again, good morning and thanks for joining us today. I'm Dorothy Barnett, Executive Director of the Climate and Energy Project, which is the founder of the Clean Energy Business Council, and I'm your host for today. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing utility scale solar development and battery energy storage with two industry professionals, Robert Wright, Renewable Energy Development Manager at Burns and McDonald, and Frank Jacob, Energy Storage Technology Manager at Black & Veatch. Our moderator will be CEP, CEP board member and former solar project manager, Bill Rausch. I know that conversations about solar energy development can be an emotional topic for some. And during the webinar, we may have those who are ardently support solar, as well as those who may be ardently opposed. We use a simple set of rules to guide our interactions in this virtual space and beyond, and we ask for your help with them today. The most effective use of our time together is to ask questions in the Q&A box rather than add commentary. So before we get started, I want to introduce you to the Climate and Energy Project and the Clean Energy Business Council. When Kansans will have questions about renewable energy, they turn to the Climate and Energy Project. For 14 years, CEP has been a trusted leader focusing on renewable energy as a productive long-term solution with economic, environmental, and climate benefits. Our mission is to build resilience in Kansas through equitable clean energy solutions and climate action. Our programs address clean energy, climate resilience, climate and energy policy, and civic participation. We do some of this work through the Clean Energy Business Council, or CEBC, which is a membership organization made up of industry leaders focused on creating a policy environment that will hasten the transition to clean energy through advocacy and regulatory frameworks. CEBC provides a place for thought leaders to gather and share information while networking with like-minded professionals. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for the webinar, Bill Rausch. Bill is retired from the Black & Beach Renewables Group. While at Black & Beach, he was a project manager assisting solar developers with interconnection applications. He was also the utility scale solar plant warranty manager. Bill has an undergraduate degree in urban affairs and an MBA from UMKC. He has also worked as an aide to the City Council of Kansas City, Missouri. Bill is currently a board member for the Climate and Energy Project, and it's my pleasure now to introduce Bill. It's my pleasure to be a part of this uh, program today. I think it'll be uh, very informative. Um, I. I'll um, be moderating today, and our first uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Robert Wright, and he is the Renewable Energy Development Manager for the Technical Development and Implementation of New Renewable Generation for Burns and McDonald's Energy Division. His duties include technology comparisons, cost estimating, performance optimization, economic analysis, conceptual design, siting studies, and project coordination. Additionally, Mr. Wright helps clients determine overarching project strategies to go from conception through the regulatory approval process, focusing on competitive and winning approaches. Mr. Wright incorporates current market conditions, policies, tax benefits into his analysis. He has his professional engineering license in mechanical engineering, as well as a master's degree in engineering management and a bachelor's degree in engineering physics from both from the Colorado School of Mines. Thanks, Bill. Let's get my uh, presentation going here. All right, appreciate everybody taking some time and, and give me a little bit of your day here. So, um, like Bill hit, I'm with uh, Burns and McDonald. Burns and McDonald spent um, over a decade doing renewables across uh, technology types. So solar, which I'll be focused on uh, here uh, today, and then 
uh, storage, which uh, Frank from Black and Beach will be covering as well as wind. And so, as you can see here, we've looked at this coast to coast, but uh, worked a lot here in the Midwest in our backyard uh, in the Kansas City metro area, as well as throughout Kansas with some of the uh, utility and developer players in the area. So quite a bit to get through, um, huge, huge topic. And I think I've got 20 to 25 minutes, so I'm not gonna hit everything. I'm gonna kind of gloss over a few items, but uh, uh, please submit your questions and, and we'll try to leave some time here uh, throughout the presentation to, to get to as many of those as possible. But at a high level, I wanna go through some of the overarching uh, technology trends that we're seeing and how that uh, incorporates and, and influences the way we are constructing these projects. Uh, move into how we are looking at the, the use of land and how we are efficient uh, with the, the space needed for solar. Um, how all of that combines to, to provide a, a good economic position for solar in today's market and what that really means for the country, the region, and Kansas in particular here moving forward over the next few years. So right off the bat, let's start start with the uh, solar modules, the, the photovoltaic modules here uh, shown. Uh, this is a huge piece of the conversation. Uh, this is by far the largest chunk of, of cost uh, for these solar projects. So it gets a lot of attention. And really we've seen a, a couple uh, dominant trends here over the last uh, several years with modules. Uh, the first one is that they have become more efficient um, and so the power that each individual panel is producing has uh, rapidly increased. And so in addition to efficiency benefits, the, the panels themselves are just getting larger. So a couple of years ago, we were looking at, you know, uh, 350, 380 watt panels, um, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, a lot of our analysis was, I'll say, 420 watt uh, panels. Today, most of the installations I'm seeing are uh, mid 500 watts, 540, 550 watt. And a lot of the leading suppliers are already looking at 600 watt series to be available here in the, the short term. So uh, a very rapid uh, increase in, in the size and um, output per panel. Um, this leads to some efficiencies on construction. The, the larger each individual panel is, the fewer you need to install per megawatt lets you get through your construction piece a little bit quicker. The other, the other interesting thing that came up here in the last couple of years is bifacial technology. So in addition to getting your typical solar production from the, the side of the panel that's actually facing the sun, um, what's shown here is you now have that same capability on the backside, allowing you to capture some of the sunlight that's getting reflected up off the ground, uh, giving you another little bit of an efficiency bump to the overall module. Uh, for a pretty nominal price increase. And so that's what's shown there uh, for just uh, a little graphic on, on some of the performance with the bifacial gain. So two important trends there for the modules themselves. Another piece that has been changing is how the module interfaces with the actual steel support. So uh, there's been a lot of focus on how do you clip each of these in you know, a little bit quicker. And when we're thinking about solar, um, the name of the game is, is shaving seconds off of every individual task you're gonna do. Uh, as you look at uh, installing one panel, um, when you go through a field, you're gonna be doing the same item tens of thousands of times. So uh, making those connections a little bit easier, again, just making everything a little bit more streamlined when you're out there installing them. For the actual racking itself, the main trend in the industry has been away from fixed tilt, which is there on the left, um, and more towards what's on the right, which is single axis tracking. And um, when I'm talking about this and, and some of the future topics here, it's generalizations for large scale, utility scale, um, greenfield uh, construction of solar. So uh, certainly applications where one or the other makes better sense, but traditionally we had fixed tilt shown there on the left, um, those were long east-west rows with the, the panels just stationary at a tilt facing south, facing um, the sun, and they just stayed there throughout the day, throughout the season, throughout the years. Uh, what we're moving towards is single axis tracking shown on the right. You can see that kind of fan uh, gear shape um, that's 
uh, going to rotate that torque tube. And so we're looking down to the south on this picture. Uh, you can see the sun peeking up in the east. And so the panels now are long north-south rows and they face the, the east in the morning, come parallel with the ground by noon, and then rotate all the way around to track the sun as it sets. So they actually tracks the sun on a daily basis. And again, just provides us a little bit more efficiency, uh, gives us a little bit more bang for our buck for every panel that we're installing. So just trying to get uh, the most production out of each of these as possible. A little bit more upfront logistics, um, but uh, worth it in, in the end for overall uh, production and economics of the project. And then just kind of continuing with the theme uh, to wrap in a few kind of final items. Everything is getting larger. Um, what I'm showing on the bottom left is a inverter. Uh, so this takes our direct current power, um, DC power being produced by the solar modules themselves and um, converts that to AC power that we can use uh, on our grid and our homes. And it used to be, we had a lot of small inverters throughout the, the solar field. Now, um, in the same vein of let's get bigger items and do uh, fewer fewer touch points, uh, the industry is going to these large central inverters, three to five megawatts uh, per unit. And so you'll have roughly uh, 20 acres of solar modules all coming to a single skid like this uh, to convert to AC power. And similarly, uh, what I'm showing in the top right, rather than running a bunch of custom cut to length uh, uh, cable that you're cutting in the field, that you're terminating in the field, um, the industry's really moved towards standardizing uh, those lengths. And so doing your design up front and getting um, prefabricated cable harnesses like, like that shown uh, that can be installed quicker, take the time out of the field and uh, really trying to make everything as close to plug and play as possible uh, just to get through this uh, more quickly and more efficiently. So as we're talking about the overall trends in the technology, uh, the components getting bigger, the scale getting bigger, I wanted to hit on what that looks like for the actual land uh, that we're using. So this is a uh, picture uh, actually just on the Missouri side out, out, of, uh, out of Kansas a bit, but Southwest Missouri. Um, it was a site that was a EPA super fund. So some kind of pretty nasty uh, old mining site um, had been reclaimed. Nothing was growing on there when we got out there. Uh, we did a pretty aggressive seed mix. And uh, as you can see, it, it definitely took off. Um, the left-hand side has been mowed, right-hand side uh, needs to be mowed. But really the, the main thing I'm focusing on here uh, is, is less about the maintenance needed to keep them from overgrowing the panels and more about just the consideration of what do you do with the land when you're using quite a bit of acreage um, to make sure that whatever you are disturbing uh, goes back to as close to the original environment as possible. So a lot of discussion on what type of ground cover to plant, making sure that that takes after um, you're done with construction and that you're getting good ground cover, uh, providing ecological benefits, uh, and a lot of discussion about pollinator habitat. Um, on a lot of sites, that'll be... Um, planted uh, and seeded around the perimeter where we can let it grow up a little bit further um, and not get in the way of the uh, solar panels themselves. So a lot of focus there on, hey, we're, we're disturbing a lot of land. How do we uh, get it back to uh, the state um, that it started out in um, by the time we're wrapping up? Along that same uh, line of thought, looking at just overall space optimization. When we're talking about solar, just to throw out a few numbers here, uh, it's about six acres for every megawatt uh, that we are installing uh, when we're using that single axis tracking system. So a fairly good size utility scale project these days is around 100 megawatt. Uh, so that's a 600 acre site. So that's quite a bit of land. Um, the industry is moving towards larger and larger installations. Um, the bigger the uh, installation, the better economies of scale, the uh, higher the efficiencies are, the, the uh, more streamlined the procurement process becomes. And so to get the lowest cost energy from solar, uh, we are tending to see larger and larger sites. So uh, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts for sure, 
pushing up to two, three, 400 megawatt sites. So for this 100 megawatt example, you need 600 acres of usable space. What we're showing here is um, several splotches that kind of look red and yellow here. Those are uh, some wetlands and other avoided features that, that we don't want to disturb, don't want to mess with some environmentally sensitive areas. And so if you have a, a mixed use kind of set of land, you may have a thousand acres needed to get uh, 100, 100 megawatts um, into a concise layout like this. But one of the points I wanted to show here is it really becomes a bit of a game of Tetris. We're laying out these blocks, trying to be as compact as possible, get them to fit together so that we aren't using any more land or disturbing more land than we need to. Uh, trying to be respectful given how much space this does take to, to produce power. So talking about the, the trends in technology, the scale of solar increasing, um, the, the magnitude of the projects and the construction efficiencies, uh, really all of that is building to um, the topic of the economics for solar. So this is from uh, Lazard's public report, um, came out a few months ago, uh, their, their uh, levelized cost of energy comparison. Uh, I think this is their 14th version. Um, but what this shows is the ranges of costs for uh, different types of generation uh, for new installations um, on a dollar per megawatt hour. So for every megawatt hour of, of energy coming out to uh, the grid, uh, how much are you paying for that uh, over the lifetime of the project. And so what I've highlighted here are the two categories that are photovoltaic uh, solar um, technologies. And what you can see is uh, this is on the, the low end of the spectrum. It's, it's as low as cost as, as there is out there um, outside of you know, wind and in certain instances. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, this is a generic study for the technology in general, right? This does not consider a specific site or any specific challenges associated with a uh, specific region. Um, so obviously there's always considerations around that regard, but in general, what we're seeing is uh, solar on a energy uh, basis is about as, as low cost of energy as we can get here in the US. And this is uh, unsubsidized, so it does not include any sort of tax benefits or other uh, subsidies there that we'll discuss here in just a couple slides briefly. So how did we get there? Again, looking at the same uh, report from Lazard, uh, they had a great graphic here showing the historical uh, cost of solar. And if we just go back 12 years, solar was roughly 10 times the cost that it is today, right? So we've had a dramatic reduction in pricing. Um, what you can see with this curve is we had that big decline we're starting to level out a little bit. So um, most projections still have uh, solar decreasing on a, a levelized cost of energy basis uh, into the future. However, we're not expecting the, the large uh, drops that we've seen in the past. So leveling out a little bit, um, but those rapid advancements in particular around module technology, their efficiency and their size, as well as some of those construction efficiencies have really helped drive this cost down uh, to the range that we're seeing today. Again, this uh, chart is the unsubsidized uh, cost of solar. So let's just spend a little bit, um, you could spend a whole day getting into the, the tax implications around renewables, but um, let's just hit it with one slide uh, because it is a big part of the equation right now. So on top of relatively low, ener low cost energy in general, um, we still have investment tax credits associated with solar. Uh, so through the end of next year, we have a 26% investment tax credit, which I'll oversimplify a little bit, but uh, really means that if you are putting in $100 worth of solar, you can get $26 back dollar for dollar as a tax credit at the end of the year, um, uh, offsetting your tax liability. So. Um, big advantages uh, helping helping move the industry forward. Uh, it will be uh, kind of remain to be seen how this shapes up with some of the current legislation being proposed. Uh, if this gets extended, and if so, in what manner? Uh, but right now, this is uh, um, providing some some benefit to the industry moving forward as well. 
So with that, with the, the advancements that we're looking at and uh, the economic kind of positioning of solar that's making it attractive uh, for utilities and for developers to consider, um, the real question is, what does that mean for, for uh, the nation? What does that mean for our region? What does that mean for Kansas? So uh, shouldn't come as a huge surprise, but if we look at the interconnection queue, so all of the projects that are currently uh, applying to connect into our transmission uh, grid throughout the United States, um, the majority of the projects are solar projects right now. That's that nice uh, yellow chunk there, 36%, so over a third of the projects in the queue today to be built over, I'll say the next three to five years for the vast majority of them. Our solar, that's over 215,000 megawatts, 215 gigawatts of solar in the queue today. Not all of those will end up being built, uh, but those are sites that have some form of uh, site control and uh, are interested enough to at least submit an application to evaluate their projects connecting into our transmission grid. So that's across the whole, whole US, but let's take a little closer look to our region. So. Our independent service operator, SPP, uh, covers all of Kansas, Midwest, kind of goes up through to the north. But throughout this region that we're showing here, um, a lot of projects in the queue uh, for SPP, and that's 48,000 megawatts there. Uh, as a point of reference, this region has approximately 700 megawatts of solar currently installed. So that's a decent chunk, but really a pretty small portion compared to how much is in the queue today. So just to provide, a, we're here now, and what people are hoping to do is orders of magnitude greater throughout this region. And just to zoom in a little further, if we look at Kansas specifically, uh, I think Kansas has probably less than 50 megawatts of solar installed today, um, but over 11,000 megawatts in the queue um, throughout Kansas. So uh, similar to what we're seeing in the region, uh, just a little bit, some, some starts here and there, but um, looking to, to ramp up as we move forward in the future. And one way that that's, you know, a little bit more visible, a little bit more public is to look at what the regulated utilities are doing. Um, so a couple of the ones here uh, in my backyard, uh, Evergy, uh, release their integrated resource plan. Uh, they are planning 700 megawatts of solar by 2025, another 2,500 megawatts of solar by 2032, I believe. Um, they're currently installing their first community solar at, uh, uh, in Kansas City. That's on the Missouri side just a little bit, but that's a 10 megawatt installation there. And then also um, Liberty uh, Utilities, the Empire District down out of Joplin, Missouri, uh, they're looking for you know roughly 100 megawatts by 2025 that could either be southwest Missouri or southeast Kansas. Um, so uh, regulated utilities looking at solar um, plus developers uh, um, looking to install solar throughout the state. So um, the economics are there. Uh, the projects are already lining up in the queue. Uh, the plan and the forecasts have been laid out to, to ask for this. So. It's a, a coming attraction to Kansas at a much larger scale than what we've seen to date. And then just to wrap up and kind of tie into uh, my, my co-presenter Frank's uh, uh, topic, I'll hit a little bit on uh, the natural pairing of solar plus storage, right? Um, in the short term, you know, we'll see a lot of solar going in. I think in the mid to, to long term, it makes a lot of sense to have our solar facilities paired uh, with batteries. And so let's just take a look at one, uh, again, a little bit overly simplistic graphic, but uh, illustrates the point here. So in a particular region, a hypothetical scenario, you've got a, a certain load uh, that that region needs, a certain amount of energy that they need uh, throughout the day, and that's represented by the thick black line. Now, as you start installing solar uh, in a place like Kansas that doesn't have very much of it, uh, it's not really, you know, uh, an issue. It's, it's nice, low cost energy. There's not much solar in there currently. So whatever it produces, whenever the sun shines, uh, the grid can, can absorb and uh, everybody's happy. Uh, what we're looking at here is what if you get a specific region 
uh, where you have enough solar that you start stacking it up. It's all uh, generating at the same time when the sun's out and you end up with uh, more production than you need during those daylight hours there in the middle of the day. And this is similar to, to what we're seeing out in California. Uh, so what we're showing here is that overproduction, that kind of nice bell-shaped curve there um, in light blue uh, gets, uh, goes to charging a battery during that time. You don't need it to serve your customers, so uh, charge a battery with that and then discharge a battery uh, in the darker blue there to help smooth out and provide some additional generation uh, when the sun's not shining in the evening or the early morning or overnight. So uh, some natural, natural pairing there to be able to, to benefit and complement one another um, as, a, as a resource mix. Again, this is overly simplistic. Uh, you know, the, the real solution is a, a fairly complex mix of, of generation types, but I think the, the solar and storage combination is, is definitely worth keeping an eye on. So uh, with that, um, a lot of uh, different topics, uh, a little bit on the technical, a little bit on the construction, some on the economics, uh, even touch on the policy, but uh, went through a ton there quickly. Uh, hopefully at least some of it was was relevant to what you were wanting to get at, but um, Bill, hopefully we've got some, some good questions coming in that we can take a look at for a little bit here. We do, and thank you very much, Robert. That was a very good uh, uh, explanation of the basics of, of what a utility scale solar plant is. Uh, Lisa asked a question about uh, expanding on the vegetation types that are planted around the uh, modules and what kind of maintenance is needed. Yeah, no, great question. And so what we found is there's not really a one size fits all. Um, unlike some of those other trends where it's, you know, very consistent, I could probably walk into, uh, you know, a number of different solar uh, developments and, and see very similar items in terms of racking and modules and, and how it's being wired together. Um, the vegetation seems to really be a owner preference. Uh, a lot of it has to do with what was there before, right? And trying to match that natural habitat that was there or even improve upon it. Um, so there's quite a bit of leeway on, on the exact seed mixes that uh, an owner or off taker will, will end up requesting. Um, then the maintenance piece uh, does get a little bit tricky, right? Um, you have this trade-off between, you can have some, some great uh, seed mixes, but sometimes they'll grow up a little bit too tall. Uh, so for the most part, it's regular mowing, making sure you've got a piece of equipment that can get in between those steel posts uh, and, and go through that efficiently. Uh, in certain instances, people um, take a little bit more natural approach and, and you can even hire uh, uh, or own sheep to maintain uh, vegetation control there at a solar facility. Well, that's good. There was another question about the uh, sheep grazing. I'm seeing more and more of that from around the country. There's even a, an American uh, grazing associate, solar grazing association now. So they have regular uh, discussions about that. They seem yeah. to be the preferred animal uh, the, the fun yeah. thing that I always remember is, uh, you know, goats are less picky, where it, which can be beneficial for grabbing, you know, weeds and stuff like that. But the problem is goats jump up on things. So you'll, yeah. you'll end up with goats on top of your panels, but sheep uh, just stay on the ground and munch away. That's right. Um, there are some more questions here. Uh, one is about the... Um, uh, inverters and the um, problems that they have. There's a, a Kansas installation that apparently has had some inverter problems. I know as the warranty manager for utility scale solar plants, you know, uh, panels just don't usually go bad, but inverters can, although in my experience, it was actually very rare. There was one model that that did have uh, kind of repeated problems. Those got fixed by the uh, manufacturer and the you know plant continued to operate, but uh, fine. But uh, what's yeah. been your experience? Yeah, from, from what I've heard from the team, um, you know, I think there were some, some issues with certain uh, manufacturers, uh, probably I'll say five years ago. Uh, there was a lot of, of different entries in, in the market, a lot of different manufacturers that are no longer in business. And that creates problems if you have a, 
manufacturer that went out of business and potentially they went out of business because their product wasn't great. Um, so not only do you have a somewhat inferior product, but now you've got somebody that's not there to maintain it. So I have heard of issues with that with some of our older uh, solar installations in the US. Uh, the good news is that um, today with the, the industry being much more mature, uh, we've really consolidated down to uh, a smaller list of, of very high quality um, and reputable and, and large. They're going to be around for a while, inverter manufacturers. So I think, um, you know, vast majority of anything that we see now, we feel very confident that they're going to stand behind their warranty, uh, that the inverters are going to hold up, you know, throughout the, the expected lifetime. If that if there are any issues, uh, you'll be able to get uh, components or replacements to, to swap those out. So I don't think that will be a continued problem in the industry to the extent that it has been in the past. Speaking of some of these uh, lifetime issues and, and uh, you know, equipment uh, issues, uh, uh, what about the idea of, uh, or it's more than an idea, but the reality of uh, decommissioning plants and how it's handled the, you know, these are expected to last 30 years, but at some point that 30 years is up. So what uh, is the normal practice for uh, plants like this on decommissioning. Sure. Yeah. And that'll be very interesting to see how it evolves, right? Because we're still a fairly young industry. And like you mentioned, Bill, uh, with 25 to 30 year lifetimes, we don't have a ton of retirements uh, happening today. And, and those that are, are much smaller scale than what we'll have tomorrow, right? Um, so that will be an, an, a, a segment of solar that definitely evolves here over the next uh, few decades. Uh, today, a lot of it gets landfilled, and there's a lot of studies on how that can be done safely. Um, depending on the technology, if we're looking at polycrystalline versus thin film, uh, there's you know different uh, items to keep in, in mind and, and potential hazardous waste and, and different ways to go about recycling. But there are already a number of, of startups looking at the end goal of let's recycle as much as we can from panels, right? And so uh, the glass, for example, is, is pretty straightforward to recycle a, a large percentage of that. Um, using the plastic that's in there, recycling the metal for the, the frame, uh, and then getting down to the actual cells themselves and looking at either reusing the cells or breaking them down and repurposing a lot of that material. So I, I've it's an emerging market, but I fully expect that in the next couple of decades, somebody or a couple of different companies will probably crack that and we'll see the vast majority of, of the materials uh, getting recycled from uh, solar panels. Okay. Um, getting to the, trying to think like a planner and uh, what the community will see in, in one of these installations, a couple of things come up. Uh, height, for instance, uh, you know, there's still uh, old pictures of power towers. I don't know. I mean, what what's your thought on uh, the likelihood of those being in this uh, Midwestern region? And uh, and then the other aspect is uh, substations are part of this too, in one way or another. How do substations fit in, and and what do those look like? Sure, I'll flip back to this slide as a visual. Um, so in general, uh, we're seeing photovoltaic solar as the solution. Uh, we really have not seen much in the way of concentrated solar. Uh, that's got the, the large tower that a bunch of mirrors are reflecting up to. So I don't expect that to be a, a uh, technology being installed throughout Kansas. What we'll see is a lot of installations that look like this. Uh, roughly speaking, the uh, steel post there coming up to the torque tube is going to be somewhere in the order of four to five feet above ground. Uh, so you're looking at something that's, you know, overall slightly taller than, than a person would be uh, standing out there. So very low profile in general for all of the uh, acreage that you're, you're looking at. Um, Bill, you brought up the substation. That's really the only structure that'd be a little bit taller. Um, uh, and so there you're looking at, you know, some, some uh, transmission distribution type poles and, and dead ends. And so that's, you know, maybe 20 to 30 foot high. But the good news is when people are looking at, and then I'll jump to the next slide, when people are trying to find a site and they're trying to figure out where to build a large scale solar, 
they want to be close to existing infrastructure. They want to tie into the existing transmission lines and substations that are already in place. And so um, any new installations, new, new uh, substation equipment uh, is likely to either be adjacent to existing equipment or modifications to that. And any new transmission lines, typically uh, developers and utilities are trying to minimize those. So um, hopefully not a ton with, with well-placed and well-sited projects. Okay. Um, Mary asked about uh, stray voltage and uh, the, uh, or do, do you test for stray voltage is what they said. My initial response as warranty manager is the equipment will tell you quickly uh, if there's something wrong and uh, needs to be uh, looked into. Yeah, there's, there's a, um, a number of QA, QC steps, uh, quality assurance, quality control steps for the actual installation, uh, a fairly robust uh, performance testing uh, standards when you're commissioning a plant to make sure you're getting what you're wanting. Um, and I may be getting a tangential question here because uh, mechanical background, not electrical, but uh, one, one thing that comes up with um, solar is unlike uh, big spinning turbines that we have in, in coal or gas plants, there's no um, there's no kind of natural uh, reactive power. There's no uh, uh, inertia to the, the power generation. And so uh, one of the things that um, the uh, independent service operators, the, the transmission operators look at when you put an interconnect application in is do you have enough reactive power capabilities either through your inverters uh, and the way those are designed and, and overbuilt or through uh, capacitor banks at the substation to provide the uh, um, reactive power frequency control uh, to get a stable output from your, your uh, solar field. So this one uh, is uh, from an anonymous person, but um, the, they ask about the guidance for firefighters managing grass fires or other inverter fires. And again, as a warranty manager, you know, I have had experience with inverter fire and they, the ones that I have experience with, you know, it didn't expand beyond the inverter itself. So there's no expansion of that to any other uh, area. Uh, I don't know if I, I've not read in the industry press much about any kind of grassland type fires or anything like that. I haven't seen anything actually and uh, related to that. Have you? I'm, I'm not aware. It's a great question. I, I am not aware of uh, any instances where that's happened, but I can see where the question's coming from. If you had a fire that was spreading through grass over a large fenced in area, uh, what do you do for access? So um, that's interesting. I'll have to go uh, ask some of my teammates if they've heard about that after this. Uh, I think uh, we'll try uh, one more question. And um, uh, any uh, differences between the uh, approval processes that are significant for um, planning purposes and then and those sorts of things? Uh, uh, and it, this gets into the battery a little bit, but I know sometimes the, it's a solar only, sometimes it's a solar and a battery, and there's maybe a slightly different process, but that's usually with the regional transmission group or the utility. Uh, the impact of, of, of that sort of thing rather than uh, for planners, I guess. Yeah, and, and right, when we're looking at planning and approvals, there's, there's multiple tracks that you just have to keep in mind with solar, and that is a little bit different by state. You know, here we're focused on Kansas, but it's different state to state with what the Public Utility Commission will approve in terms of a, a plant. It's different for what that regional transmission operator will approve and what they want to see for the transmission interconnect application. Uh, a city or township or county uh, will have different permitting requirements that you have to follow. follow. Um, so we uh, go through a lot of that um, as a mix between our civil design and our environmental scientists. Um, there's quite a bit in the way of approvals for when you're looking at a layout, you want to make sure that you're not building over a bunch of jurisdictional wetlands and, and uh, delineated streams. So uh, the environmental studies that you go through that need to be approved by the Army Corps of Engineers, 
uh, your certificate of, of convenience and necessity. There's a number of different approvals and making sure that you're keeping line of sight on best practices for each of those and getting them done in an orderly fashion to where none of them are, are the final hang up uh, delaying your project is, is important. Okay, well, I think that's uh, the time we have for questions uh, right now. And uh, we're ready to uh, move on to take a look at uh, energy storage. Thanks, Bill. Very good. And uh, with that, I'll uh, introduce uh, Mr. Frank Jacob. He's a professional engineer and a PMP in the energy storage, uh, and he's the energy storage manager at Black & Beach, technology manager at Black & Beach. He uh, leads the design of energy storage systems that improve and enhance renewable and conventional energy generation. He has over 30 years of experience with developing new applications for products. Uh, now his focus is on the electrochemical devices, which are batteries and fuel cells, and bulk storage technology like pumped hydro, compressed air, sensible and latent thermal heat storage technologies that are used in short, mid, and long-term energy storage applications for renewable energy, which basically means solar and wind. And, but also for conventional generation, which involve turbines, engines, hydroelectric generation, thermal power plants, uh, he can benefit those as well. Frank adds energy storage to improve operations, extend life, increase responsiveness, and decrease emissions, including emissions, including carbon footprints and greenhouse gases. Most recently, Frank has been growing Black & Veatch's energy storage uh, engineering procurement and construction practice and uh, is their owner engineering services that they provide to clients. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frank to present on storage. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Let me get the sharing started and let me get the slide decks started. Can my slide be seen? Yes, Frank. All right. Um, uh, Frank Jacob, technology manager for energy storage, and that's energy storage uh, writ large. So thermal, mechanical, different ways to store energy as well as store electricity. Um, I, I neglected to put my uh, uh, collegiate pedigree. Uh, I've got my master's uh, degree in mechanical engineering um, in thermodynamics, heat transfer fluke mechanics, you know, the, the primitive way we used to make electricity and now it's all solid state with photovoltaic panels and, and uh, wind-driven turbines. So um, uh, at Black & Veatch, we're an infrastructure Firm. So power is infrastructure, telecommunications is infrastructure, water, clean water, um, water treatment, as well as uh, the water division that deals with pumped hydro hydroelectric facilities that have been load leveling the load on, on coal and nuclear plants for over a century. And so we've been in for energy storage a long time. And today, specifically, I'm going to talk about battery energy storage. Uh, that's uh, uh, Robert, two years ago, there weren't any solar plants with battery energy storage. And now there's many, and, and those interconnection queues you talked about are, are going to be 80% solar and storage going forward. And that's because as we'll see on the next slide, uh, the cost of, of storage has broken through the floor below which it is now economical, not only on the East and West Coast where um, energy prices are high and, and higher cost equipment, made economic sense. But here in the Midwest, where energy prices are low, but these battery energy storage systems are able to, to compete with the next best technology. But um, first, uh, storage is not new to this region. In 2010, uh, then Kansas City Power and Light was one of the 20 awardees from the Department of Energy infrastructure grants. There was the need for an infrastructure bill 10 years ago. Um, after a downturn in the economy, 
uh, now we have the downturn in the, in the pandemic and, and we're trying to recover from that. But um, uh, that was a big smart grid project, many elements to that, but one of them was a battery component. And there you see the battery that was downtown uh, Kansas City. It was part of what was then called the Cream Zone. And um, uh, basically what that means is, is in 2010, one hour of storage costs well over $1,000 per kilowatt of power you get out. Uh, five years later, it was half that. Five years later, again, last year, it was again half that. And today, it's less than $175 per kilowatt for one hour of storage. And, and it's getting lower in 2025 and 2030. So uh, just like that curve Robert showed of, of solar panels coming down, storage is still on that steep decline because there's a lot of um, costs that can be wrung out of the manufacturing of, of, of batteries as the volume of production increases. And, and a simple economic analysis might show that uh, it would add two cents per kilowatt hour of electricity produced, say on top of the three cent a kilowatt hour that solar may produce energy for, for a net five. But um, where that makes economic sense, it's going in today. Uh, if you search for smart grid and Kansas City Power and Light, you'll, you'll find a replete uh, array of reports that, that covers that um, uh, Department of Energy financially supported project that a number of participants um, uh, here in town and, and other suppliers uh, provided the technology for. It's where the lessons learned to wring out some of those early stage problems were learned that have, have caused batteries to become a, an essential element of the grid today. So let's talk about uh, battery energy storage and, and go through some fundamentals where it fits and then go to some uh, interesting tidbits about it. So what's all this buzz you hear and read about energy storage? Well, it's as inexpensive as ever. Like I just said, it, it, it's well less than 20% of the cost 10 years ago. And as the cost goes down, you see that little short chart on the right, uh, the volume the, that, that goes up. You know, five years ago, in a flat screen TV cost $5,000. Maybe one in a city was bought. Today, they cost $500. And so it's that price decline that then drives up the uh, uh, inventory that gets sold. Uh, I say inexpensive for a reason, because it's not cheap. It's still about $200 uh, uh, for one hour of, of storage. And then there's, you've got to buy inverters, you got to do some civil works, you got to do other things. So it's not cheap, it is inexpensive. And so sizing and optimizing are still going to be important. And that's part of the engineering that uh, companies like uh, Black and & Beach and Burns McDonald do for our clients. Uh, why is this? Well, those lithium ion battery cells, the ones used in your mobile devices, your phones and uh, uh, pads and, and laptops, they're the same cells, the same chemistry is being used in stationary energy storage on the grid. And so those economies of scale, making batteries for mobile devices, making batteries for electric vehicles is driving down the cost for those of us that want to use energy storage on the grid. And there are issues, of course, there's safety, there's lifetime, there's decommissioning, uh, there's uh, repurposing of, of batteries once they can no longer, say, survive, uh, provide the driving distance in the electric vehicle, but they can be repurposed on, on the grid and that may even lower the cost of battery energy storage. Uh, storage used to be a, a, a solution. It could do a lot of things looking for a problem. And today, because of its, uh, being inexpensive, it's, it's more of a solution to many problems. Uh, one such problem is, is smoothing solar. And, and that's what Robert talked about. I'll touch on that, but also other places where storage could be used. So where does energy storage fit on this power grid of ours? Think about it, generation transforms energy into electricity. It transforms solar, it transforms wind, it transforms coal, fossil fuels into electricity. What happens next is the transmission system moves that electricity from where it's generated to where it's used from here th through there. It's like a, uh, it moves electricity through space. Energy storage moves electricity from now until later. 
That's a key element. It saves energy. It not only saves energy now, it saves electricity now to be used later. We've never been able to save electricity like that before. It's almost like a time machine for electricity. And then equipment in your businesses and your home transform that electricity into the services we value. Uh, really, I don't want to buy electricity. I want to buy my lights on, my water cold, my beer cold, my internet fast, my phone's charged. These are the services that we look to buy electricity to, to serve our, our, our comfort needs. So energy storage is this new grid asset. It's been it enables uh, the growth of renewable variable, variable renewable energy generation, and it co it's compounds what used to be variable loads. You know, it used to be power production was steady. The power plant would run at steady state and the loads would vary, and there'd be other equipment on the grid that would track those loads. Well, now generation is varying. We wanna generate all the solar power we can in the middle of the day. We wanna generate all the wind power we can after midnight when the wind resource is usually the highest. And so energy storage is a solution for the grid to help maintain stability. It balances variable renewable energy generation. And um, what is it that it does it specifically? Well, uh, I'll describe it and then I'll talk about the application. Something called peak shaving. This happens mostly in, in commercial and industrial facilities. This is when they start ramping up and using a lot of electricity. Uh, air conditioning, for instance, is a perfect application. In the, in the summer, we're using more air conditioning than at other times of the year. And on a hot summer day, we're using a lot more air conditioning than other days of the summer. And so a, a battery would be located at that site, would be able to provide the electricity for that peak air conditioning without having to build new distribution circuits to bring that power through the, through the transmission system. Time shifting is a new description of, of between the time that electricity is generated to the time it's needed. And in solar, that, that's noon to evening when we want to make that change shift, a couple of hours. For wind, it's usually overnight because the wind resource is highest after midnight when the load is the lowest. So we'd rather than curtail that generation, we'd like to store that generation and use it later in the day. Here's a technical term, a term of art, uh, non-wires alternatives. This is how can you accomplish delivering electricity without building new transmission and distribution circuits. And for instance, uh, here in the Midwest, that might be a long rural distribution line uh, out to a little town, out to a facility. And it might cost a million dollars a mile to build a distribution line. If it's 20 miles long, that's $20 million. You could put a battery there for $5 million that could serve that excess load during the middle of the summer without having to invest. So it, it, it's, it's sometimes called um, T&D deferral, transmission and distribution investment deferral. That is, we, for a lower price, we could solve that problem for enough time that we could then uh, either solve it in other ways or build those distribution circuits. And finally, there's renewable smoothing. We know solar varies dramatically, uh, minute by minute. Uh, wind varies dramatically. And this will stabilize, make predictable the generation that we get from our renewable. Uh, I call it firm dispatchable generation from our renewable resources. Energy storage is this new grid asset. It, uh, it serves a load. It looks like a load. It, you could store electricity. It looks like it's consuming electricity, but it's not consuming it. It's going to deliver it later on and, and look like a generator. And so it, it has this multifunction capacity for doing things like that on the grid. And here's a picture of the grid. Left to right, uh, we've got uh, bulk storage for generation, conventional generation, solar generation. Uh, all these green dots are different forms of generation. You see them on the gener bulk side on the left and distributed generation on the right, uh, solar rooftop, community solar, uh, commercial solar. And then um, you see the distribution and transmission system, the blue dots that are in here, taking that electricity from where it's generated to delivering it where it's used. 
And then an orange is every place that storage can be used and you see orange dots all over the place. It can be used on the bulk generation scale. It can be used in the mid scale at substations and, and uh, sub transmission lines. And then it could be used uh, wherever energy is, is being consumed, electricity is being consumed for delivering those services that I talked about. And what solar and storage is, is, is a form of hybrid generation. It's a new term of art that's developed nationally from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, sometimes called FERC by its initials. Um, hybridization is adding storage to generators so that they become more functional. You know, uh, when the Model T Ford was rolling off the line, you know how you had to start it? You had to run out in front of the car and turn a crank and then run back in the car and drive it. Well, a uh, battery starter came along and that's a form of hybrid generation. The battery starts the car, but the motor runs the car. And now we're doing that with the grid and all the generation on the grid. We're doing it with uh, buildings, we're doing it with solar, we're doing it with wind, uh, run of river, conventional hydroelectric uh, with turbines and power plants. We're even put, putting it at substations where there might not be enough um, uh, elements in the substation to transmit all the electricity that's being supplied to that substation so it could be stored and then transmitted later without having to curtail that energy and not produce it. Energy storage is bottom line, equipment that enables flexible and increased benefits for the grid. And there are lots of benefits and I'm not going to go through the details on this slide, but uh, you could see uh, renewables is what we're talking about today but it, it can provide backup, it can provide resiliency. Boy, New Orleans would have loved some resiliency on their grid earlier in September when their grid went down for many, many weeks. Uh, Texas as well this summer when they experienced their cold wave and their generation went down. So uh, resiliency is a new term that you'll be hearing about. And, and in the lower left of this diagram, some call a, a battery like a, a Swiss army knife for the grid. It could do many things. You could design a single facility to do several of those things. And it can add benefit as the price gets lower and lower. Here's an example of a facility that uh, Black and Beach has built. Um, in terms of uh, size, this is about a quarter acre site. And you'll see that there's a, uh, five of these um, each uh, two and a half kilowatt uh, hour inverters for a little over 10 megawatts, um, uh, two and a half megawatt inverters, along with the containers that have the batteries inside of them. Uh, and, and this facility that's nominally uh, 10 megawatts and, and four hours of storage takes up about a quarter of an acre. Uh, Robert talked about a hundred acre megawatt solar plant that takes 600 acres. Well, if you wanted to put one hour of storage at 100 megawatts on that site, it would take up one more of those acres, one out of 600. So it, it, it's not very aggressive at land use. It does look a lot like power equipment. So it would be put where substations and transformers and other things would normally be located. Uh, here's two pictures. Uh, on the left is what uh, those containers that, can, that have the batteries inside them look like. Uh, these are individual modules uh, in racks. Each module is just like the module that might be in the electric vehicle if you have one. Uh, nominally, each one has 20 or 30 kilowatt hours. Uh, you need 10 of them to get up to 200 or 300 kilowatt hours in a rack, and you might have um, 10 of those racks to put two megawatt hours inside a container. And so it, it's very repeatable uh, like the modules in, in the solar fields. And so learning how to load these racks effectively and put them on in the field is, is an important part of the balance of system cost engineering that uh, engineering firms like Black and Beach do. On the right is, is the new thing that's been out. Um, this is a factory built container. It's got the battery racks in it. It has its controls in it. Uh, batteries, if you don't know, for, need to be maintained at, uh, at uh, about uh, 20 degrees Celsius temperature, maybe room temperature nominally. And so each one of these has a little chiller to do that. And, and uh, this one might contain about uh, uh, 
400 kilowatt hours. So you might put a row of these adjacent to one of those megawatt inverters that you saw in the solar field on, on Robert's diagram. And that would provide the energy storage for each one of those blocks on a solar field. Uh, so the, the storage system need not necessarily be built um, as one piece that's electrically interconnected. It could be distributed using these individual outdoor rated units throughout the solar field. Uh, so with that, I show you in the upper left-hand corner, a standalone battery system, a little cartoon, just so you see the parts and pieces. There are the batteries, uh, and there, there are tens of thousands of these individual cells uh, in a facility. Uh, it has a power conversion system to take the DC current that you get from batteries and convert that to AC. And this particular item is bi-directional. For a solar field, it just goes one way from the solar field on out to the grid. For a battery, you wanna be charging and discharging it. And um, as part of the overall system, there's a little step-up transformer to get up to distribution voltage and then a, a, a GSU to get it up to transmission voltage. In the lower right there, you see a facility that might consist of um, a number of battery systems in a hybrid facility that has uh, wind here in the background and solar here in the right background. And it's uh, providing firm dispatchable electricity, just as the grid has been expecting for, for uh, decades with conventional generation. Uh, with that, Bill, I'll turn things back over to you. Thanks very much, Frank. Great overview. Um, got a couple questions. Um, Bill Dorsett asks, can you refer us to any recent good studies of the capacity credit for distributed solar and distributed storage on the transmission and distribution systems? And I, I think he might be looking more at the, you know, a residential or, you know, neighborhood, even behind the meter type of distributed um, uh, solar and storage and how that uh, gets credited um, for capacity if, if it does. Uh, you have thoughts on that? or? Uh, yes, uh, that is not well established yet. Um, the, the general concept there is, is what is sometimes called a virtual power plant, a VPP. And that's where the hundreds of solar and storage facilities that might be distributed on a circuit, circuit with the appropriate controls could be aggregated in some way. And, and in states like um, uh, New York State and Massachusetts and California, there actually are uh, capacity credits there. So look at the, um, uh, there's a fun report title called the State of Charge that Massachusetts uh, published about uh, 2018. And it talks about that concept. It is implemented for uh, uh, getting credits for delivering capacity to the grid in those regions where electricity is expensive. And like I said, that's the West Coast and the East Coast and the urban environments. It's only as prices come down, will they become as cost effective in areas like uh, Kansas and Missouri and here in the Midwest. So good. Uh, Bill has a follow up question. Um, we know there's no 100% efficiency, no perpetual motion machine, anything like that. But he asked, what, what is the round trip efficiency of today's best uh, battery systems? I, I get asked that a lot. And I had a colleague at Black & Beach who would always say, um, uh, you know, batteries destroy energy. It, if you put 100% in, you get 90% out. So 90% is, is a, a nominal round trip efficiency for lithium ion based battery energy storage. Mm -hmm. I'll challenge Robert to, you know, in that uh, his solar panels only take in 100% of the solar, but only deliver 20% of that as electricity. <laughs> so I think my batteries are better. A little competitiveness there. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's all about, you know, there is a cost to using any of these technologies. So if the benefit of shifting that power to a different time is more than the 10% that's lost, then you know, you, you have something worthwhile, perhaps. So um, uh, uh, to add to that, uh, there, there may be more, rather than curtailing your wind or solar farm, cutting it from 
100 megawatts to 50 megawatts, it may be worth the operator to keep it operating at a more efficient capacity factor, storing that, and then returning 90% of what he stored back to the grid later on in order to maintain, maintain his fill. Uh, facility at, at a more stable operating condition. Okay. So Alice asked about, um, she mentioned some of the smaller batteries, but um, her real questions are about uh, how many charge and discharge cycles can these batteries do? Uh, can they be discharged completely? And what is their uh, uh, lifetime, you know, how many, how, how durable are these things nowadays? Well, uh, excellent questions, Alice. Uh, the, the, the system is designed um, when they're shifting energy from one time of the day to another. They're designed to cycle once a day to do that for 365 days a year for 20 years. So up to 6,000 cycles. Now, in order to do that, you know, I know when I charge and just fully charge and fully charge my cell phone, it kind of is noticeably deficient in, a, in two or three years. Uh, so in these systems, you purposefully put in more storage than the nameplate. So you're not charging it fully, you're charging it maybe to 90% and you're not discharging fu it fully. And you know that's not rare in engineered systems. In your car, you don't run it at the red line RPM all the time. You have a transmission system that, you know, you run it at, at a lower RPM. If you were to run your car at 6,000 RPM all the time, it would wear out fast too. Uh, so if you want your car to run for five or 10, in fact, I'm going on 22 years with my Honda, um, you run it at a more benign condition in order for it to last longer. Very good. Um, I want to throw out one about height because, you know, planners uh, look at things and, you know, how many stories are, is this building and all that sort of thing and what's acceptable. Uh, have you seen situations of batteries stacked uh, very high at all, or is it pretty much just one container level as far as the height? Yeah, one of these containers looks like a shipping container, you know, so it's about 10 or 12 feet tall. Um, Anybody ever pick up their battery in their car? Batteries are heavy. Batteries are really um, mass dense. And so uh, uh, one of these 20 foot containers that you see here weighs uh, about 50,000 pounds. And so while they can be stacked too, too tall, uh, we've developed designs for that. You have to reinforce the containers, so you pay a little extra for that. But if you're in a site constrained uh, a space constrained site, it's, it's worth that to the owner. Uh, I will ask you to Google a company called Energy Vault and, and they're building a crane as tall as those wind turbines you see in their background, which are stacking concrete blocks on top of each other. So that would be very, very tall, but it's a different form of energy storage. It's gravity energy storage, mm -hmm. just like pumping water uphill and then letting it run downhill and pumped hydro, they're stacking blocks tall and then letting them go down um, uh, to the ground and, and storing energy that way. Okay. So Paul asked about um, comments you might have on uh, the comparative advantages or disadvantages of compressed air uh, storage technology compared to you know batteries and other options. That's a very active area of, um, of research right now. Um, there are two compressed air storage systems built in the world, one in Germany and one down in um, Alabama. Um, and, and, and they store upwards of, of um, uh, 250 to 300 megawatts worth of power for 24 or 48 hours. So they could, they could last through these um, weather events that we've been having. Um, what it consists of is that you... you you know, use compressors that could be using renewable electricity to compress air to a high pressure, store it in underground caverns. So it has some geologic considerations as to where you can site these. Uh, the Achilles heel of, of those two plants is that they recover that energy from the compressed air by co-firing that in a gas turbine. 
That is, they remove the compressor parasitic from a gas turbine. And that kind of improves a gas turbine efficiency only by almost by a factor of two. You know, it, it lowers its carbon footprint by a by a half. Um, the, the developments underway is how to take that high pressure air and run it through an expander and have no combustion necessary to recover that energy. Okay. Um, we have a question uh, from the chat actually that uh, is about uh, battery storage on the customer side of the meter at large industrial users. Is that something that can benefit the grid as well as the customer? Uh, it can. That has an acronym and a name these days. It's called behind the meter, BTM. When, when you install a, uh, a battery at, at a customer site, uh, FTM, front of the meter, would be for these grid scale batteries. But um, uh, that's beneficial from that peak shaving standpoint that I talked about earlier, and especially industrial facilities. Uh, in between shifts, when production goes down and then production ramps up, that's another variability in the load that uh, the renewables often can't follow and that storage could fill that gap. Okay, um, uh, Bill Dorsett has another good one. Uh, the centralized, centralized thermal storage. Um, he, he asks uh, if it's limited to district heating uh, types of, he mentions a system in Austin, but I guess there's uh, at least a couple of kinds of thermal storage, the very high temperature thermal storage and maybe a more moderate uh, uh, thermal temperature storage. Do those, let's try and relate those, these types of solar plants that we uh, saw uh, Robert uh, present. Do those have applicability here? And then maybe briefly on where else they might have ap applicability. All right. That, uh, with, with solar panels, when you dig into it, um, and, and Robert could correct me, but, but their production is, is dependent on the temperature that they're at. And, and um, uh, if, if there were some, I've, I've seen at least some patents putting you know, thermocouples, thermoelectric generators on the back of solar panels in order to turn the heat into electricity and boost the electricity and cool the panels, and increase their efficiency. Uh, that's not a commercial technology to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but uh, uh, thermal energy is, is one way to store, uh, thermal storage is one way to store energy. And uh, we're all used to, to doing it at uh, mid temperature, like our 150 degree water heater at home. That gives us all the hot water that we need, unless you've got many teenagers in the house. Um, but uh, Bill referred to those tall solar power towers that used that were are in the desert with mirrors around them, focusing sunlight on something that contains rock salt. That when you get that up to five or six or seven hundred degrees centigrade, turns molten, and you can move it around, and that molten salt could be used with water to generate steam and that steam could run through a turbine and that turbine produces electricity just like a conventional power plant. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that's a, a proven technology for storing high, high temperature uh, energy and creating electricity. On the other end, uh, you know, it takes a lot of energy to, to uh, change the phase of something. And by that, that means going from water to steam or water to ice. But think about going from air to liquid air, liquefying air in a cryogenic process, the same way we liquefy natural gas through a cryogenic process to ship it very efficiently by ships. Uh, that would store a lot of air in a very small space. And then as you expand that air back to atmospheric conditions, it could generate power. Okay, another uh question we have is on the lifestyle, lifespan, <laughs> lifespan and recycling options for battery systems. And uh, I know my own just casual Google search is uh, turning up more and more and more uh, developments in that area. Uh, yes, yes. Um, the, 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 there's, there's an old joke about when you're camping and uh, with your friend and, and, and you're escaping a bear and um, uh, uh, friend said, "Hey, we run. Our, we got to run 
faster than the bear? And, and, uh, and he said, no, I only have to run faster than you. And so um, uh, the electric vehicle industry is going to have that problem far ahead of when the 20 year life of these energy storage facilities expire because 90% uh, uh, of all production of lithium ion batteries go to electric vehicles, 90%. 5% um, go to mobile devices and 5% go to stationary storage. So uh, someone else is going to have to solve that problem before a stationary system. That said, uh, let's not avoid it. Um, right now, the, the, supply, the tier one suppliers of batteries, the Samsungs of the world, the LG Chems of the world, the Panasonics of the world, they will take back these modules at the end of life and, and deal with them. And that'll be part of the contract that you sign with uh, the EPC that might build your facility for you. Um, also, there's very active um, involvement by the federal government as part of uh, research into batteries. In fact, they, they have a grant energy storage grand challenge, and uh, they're looking to accelerate the development uh, to be able to, to, just like with lead acid, where we recycle 99% of all the material in a lead acid battery, We'd like to do that with these lithium ion batteries. Um, I, I will say less than 5% of a lithium ion battery is lithium. Most of it's aluminum in the container and the graphite in the electrodes and, and uh, hydrocarbons that are in the electrolyte. So uh, it's a very complex chemical mix uh, that's not economical yet to recycle because you can buy the raw materials more cheaply, but let's hope we all get um, environmentally conscious, more conscious, and and learn to recycle these things for a, a better world. Okay, so I'd like to uh, bring Robert back into the mix here, where we can maybe have some uh, solar and or battery questions, and uh, more easily allow him to respond to anything that might come up. Please uh, put your questions in the Q and A system and. Uh, uh, for either solar or battery, and we'll uh, take a look at, at those. Um, there's one question that came in about, is there any strong case for pairing large scale solar and storage in regions that do not yet have high levels of solar penetration? I think that would fit Kansas pretty well. Are these large, are large battery systems in these regions typically being held off until solar generation increases. So that's a bit about does this battery storage follow the solar generation? You have thoughts, uh, either of you on the kind of marketing aspect or the uh, commercial aspect of, of that situation? Yeah, I, I think it depends on what the use case is, right? We see uh, applications for kind of concentrated microgrids where right off the bat you need both of them paired together because it's serving a, a certain type of function that needs a more uh, regular um, output of, of energy but I, I guess I'd say generally speaking if I go back to what Frank brought up on the use case for storage of, of it really makes a lot of sense when you've got so much solar that you're otherwise going to curtail it you're going to waste energy well, then that 90% round trip efficiency looks pretty darn good compared to zero. Uh, so I think that's really the, the primary use case. And, and to get there, it certainly helps to have a large uh, amount of, of solar penetration like you get in uh, places like California right now. Frank? Yes, uh, certainly those areas where electricity is more expensive. Um, it, it's made a business sense first, but, it, but it's coming here to the Midwest. Um, I, I, add to what Robert said, there's a specific type of solar and storage where you put the, the storage on the, on the same DC bus as the solar panels. Because there, there are really sunny days wh when the solar production is more than what the inverter could pass through it. That's called clipping. And not curtailment when, when the system tells you to turn back, but when the, the solar module, modules are producing so much, it can't get through the inverter because the inverter is optimized to produce the most over the course of the year. So if you could add batteries in order to be able to save that clipped energy, then you could increase the production of that solar field. And so it, it might make sense. And I think even with, um, with the advent of these bifacial um, uh, panels, uh, I, I've seen customers in, 
in, in uh, Canada putting in bifacial uh, solar collectors along with battery energy storage in order to get that maximum production over the course of the year. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, and we're, we're still thinking of the use case of, you know, shift energy from, you know, time one to time two. Uh, there's also natural pairings to either um, smooth out or, or kind of change the shape of solar. If you think about clouds kind of coming and going, right, your solar might kind of bounce around a little bit. You can smooth that out, which, which provides some benefits to the overall um, uh, transmission grid and can help avoid some, some costs elsewhere on the system. So yeah, there's a few different cases to consider there. Well, here's a good question from Ryan, and he's asking about the, you know, we talked about the SPPQ, the, the waiting list to get solar onto the grid in the Midwestern region, the Great Plains region. Uh, and he, his question is, how, how do they, does SPP do solar forecasts or do they, do they, um, uh, you know, when, over what period of time might we expect this, uh, you know, 11,000 uh, or uh, megawatts or 11 gigawatts of solar uh, for Kansas to be developed? Yeah, good question. Uh, unfortunately, SPP has about as long of a, a queue uh, wait time as, as anywhere in the, the country right now, and they're working on uh, getting through that and making that a little bit more efficient process. But um, without kind of going through the, the individual sites, um, I would suspect that the vast majority of that 11 uh, gigawatts of, of uh, solar um, would be uh, a planned um, commercial operation date prior to uh, 2025, so within the next five years. Um, now, again, not all of those will get built. That's what people have submitted applications for. A lot of those will drop out, but a lot of new ones will come in kind of behind them. But Usually, when you're looking at those queues, they're, they're three to five years out tops. So, um, Michael Miller asks um, a question about uh, something we, we did talk about. You talked about early the bifacial uh, uh, solar modules that collect uh, power from both sides of, of uh, from both sides of the module. Um, He's asking how well established is this technology? We, we certainly know it's commercial, but do you have ballpark estimates of the percentage of the uh, plants that are going in? Is this becoming the standard or the typical uh, module design type now? Yeah, I'd say the, the majority of polysilicon uh, installations uh, at large scale are now looking at bifacial. So uh, it definitely seems to be the... the dominant uh, technology for uh, new builds. Uh, Ro Ro Robert, on that, I might ask, uh, uh, is there the extra benefit that say, where there's a lot of snow, even uh, the backside won't get covered with snow, <laughs> it'll produce power and it'll heat up and melt the snow on top and actually produce more than any, any, any single-sided might ever do? Yep, helps it slough off. And then as soon as you get uh, snow off the front side, which the nice thing about snow is it's got a little bit of a natural abrasiveness. So you clean your panels when that happens. And as soon as you don't have snow on top and you got uh, uh, snow underneath, you got great reflection and, and um, you can get some really good uh, uh, production and, and sunny days with a little bit of snow on the ground. So Here's an, another question about the facility and uh, he addresses it to Robert, but it's kind of applicable to all, any of us, but uh, is there a way for the plants to coexist with wildlife such as deer rather than building seven foot fences around to keep them out? Thoughts on that? Yeah, that was a, a follow up to one that I had typed uh, while, while Frank was going. Uh, the, the seven foot fence is not to keep deer out, it's to uh, keep people safe and keep our equipment uh, safe, right? It's, uh, it's uh, electrical equipment that can be uh, dangerous in the wrong hands. So <clears throat> that's the, uh, the primary um, focus there, not, not keeping the wildlife out. Um, I, I will be interested to see, you know, kind of uh, sub markets and, and different applications, um, you know, as we move into say agrivoltaics, right? Uh, uh, solar mixed in with farming, right, and, and some more kind of open-ended uh, applications there that maybe don't have uh, quite the same, you know, fencing requirements and stuff. But 
right now. That's that's what I see mostly from a, a security standpoint. And the restriction is kind of just a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a bit of an open-ended one, but what benefits do you see for Kansas if, uh, if Kansas does embrace utility scale solar and it becomes a you know, significant share of the generation mix for uh, Kansas utilities? Uh, I have a short point to, to make and, and then ho hopefully Robert could chi chime in too, but, but I, I think the natural pairing of wind, Kansas already has a lot of wind and, and the difference in the production profiles, you know, wind higher after midnight and moderate during the day and it has dramatic changes paired with solar that has a nice predictable shape. The production is going to vary with the, with the clouds, but, but that pairing together is more stable delivery of electricity to the grid than either one alone. And then storage could fill in the gaps. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Frank. Um, we've done a number of, of curtailment studies and, and yeah, they, they work together very well. And, and to me, one of the biggest challenges with a lot of renewable energy is the transmission and distribution infrastructure that you have to build out to take all these wind farms and solar fields and connect them back to your, your load centers, right? And so to the extent that we already have that built out for wind, uh, for each of those point of interconnect uh, for the, the wind farm, if you can put solar and use the exact same infrastructure, uh, not have to beef up your wires or anything and have that kind of natural pairing of daytime, nighttime, uh, I think that's a huge opportunity uh, for, for Kansas in particular. Well, and certainly that's uh, how to make the grid perform better, but it's also the possibility of more uh, jobs, more maintenance jobs, more, uh, you know, uh, of those kinds of things uh, in, located in the state. So we do hope to see benefits like that. So I think that's the last question. So I will turn it back over to uh, Dorothy Barnett. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank and Robert and Bill. Um, great insights today, really robust question and answer. Uh, we appreciate having you all um, join us today. Uh, thanks to Bill for moderating. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, we hope that you have found this to be an informative and educational workshop. Um, you can find a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, and the slides will be available on our new website, climateandenergy.org. Um, if you liked what you heard and you wanna learn more, please join us on October 25th for our Energy Horizon Forum that we are co-hosting with the Kansas Advanced Power Alliance. Um, we'll dig deeper into utility scale storage, um, utility solar and electric vehicles. Um, seating will be limited, um, so please get your tickets today. And with that, I just would add an additional thank you, um, Frank and Robert and Bill. Um, excellent contact uh, content, great questions. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you again on October 25th. Thanks so much, everybody.